This is Dr. Elliot Magookin at 45 Surf University. Socrates' Apology Someone will say, and are you not ashamed, Socrates, of a course of life which is likely to bring you to an untimely end? To him I may fairly answer, There you are mistaken. A man who is good for anything ought not to calculate the chance of living or dying. He ought only to consider whether in doing anything he is doing right or wrong, acting the part of a good man or of a bad. Whereas, according to your view, the heroes who fell at Troy were not good for much, and the son of Thetis, Achilles, above all, who altogether despised danger in comparison with disgrace, and when his goddess mother said to him, in his eagerness to slay Hector, that if he avenged his companion Patroclus, and slew Hector, he would die himself. Fate, as she said, waits upon you next, after Hector. Achilles, hearing this, utterly despised danger and death, and instead of fearing them, feared rather to live in dishonor, and not to avenge his friend. Let me die next, Achilles replied, and be avenged of my enemy, rather than abide here by the beak ships, a scorn and burden of the earth. Had Achilles any thought of death and danger? For wherever a man's place is, whether the place which he has chosen or that in which he has been placed by a commander, there he ought to remain in the hour of danger, and he should not think of death or of anything but of disgrace. And this, O men of Athens, is a true saying. Socrates continues, Strange indeed, would be my conduct, O men of Athens, if I who, when I was ordered by the generals whom you chose to command me at Potikta and Amplothlis and Delium, remained where they placed me, like any other man facing death. If I say now, when as I conceive and imagine, God orders me to fulfill the philosopher's mission of searching into myself and other men, I were to desert my post through fear of death or any other fear that would indeed be strange, and I might justly be arraigned in court for denying the existence of the gods if I disobeyed the oracle because I was afraid of death. Then I should be fancying that I was wise when I was not wise, for this fear of death is indeed the pretense of wisdom, and not real wisdom being the appearance of knowing the unknown since no one knows whether death, which they in their fear apprehend to be the greatest evil, may not be the greatest good. Is there not here conceit of knowledge, which is a disgraceful sort of ignorance? And this is the point in which, as I think, I am superior to men in general, and in which I might perhaps fancy myself wiser than other men, that whereas I know but little of the world below, I do not suppose that I know. But I do know that injustice and disobedience to a better, whether God or man, is evil and dishonorable. And I will never fear or avoid a possible good rather than a certain evil. And therefore, if you let me go now and reject the counsels of Anitus, who said that I were not to be put to death, I ought not to have been prosecuted, and that if I escape now, your sons will all utterly be ruined by listening to my words, if you say to me, Socrates, this time we will not mind any of this and will let you off, but upon one condition that are to inquire and speculate in this way any more, and that if you are caught doing this again, you shall die. If this was the condition in which you let me go, I should reply, Men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I shall obey God rather than you. And while I have life and strength, I shall never cease from the practice of teaching of philosophy, exhorting anyone whom I meet after my manner, and convincing him, saying, O oh, my friend, why do you, who are a citizen of the great and mighty and wise city of Athens, care so much about laying up the greatest amount of money and honor and reputation, and so little about wisdom and truth and the greatest improvement of the soul, which you never regard or heed at all? Are you not ashamed of this? And if the person with whom I am arguing says, Yes, but I do care, 
I do not depart or let him go at once. I interrogate and examine and cross-examine him. And if I think that he has no virtue, but only says that he has, I reproach him with undervaluing the greater and overvaluing the less. And this I should say to everyone whom I meet, young and old, citizen and alien, but especially to the citizens, inasmuch as they are my brethren. For this is the command of God, as I would have you know, and I believe that to this day no greater good has ever happened in the state than my service to the God. For I do nothing but go about persuading you all, old and young alike, not to take thought for your persons and your properties, but first and chiefly to care about the greatest improvement of the soul. I tell you that virtue is not given by money, but that from virtue come money and every other good of man, public as well as private. This is my teaching, and if, the, if this is the doctrine which corrupts the youth, my influence is ruinous indeed. But if anyone says that this is not my teaching, he is speaking an untruth. Wherefore, O men of Athens, I say to you, do as Anitas bids or not as Anitas bids, and either acquit me or not, but whatever you do, know that I shall never alter my ways not even if I have to die many times. So basically right there, uh, you see a hardened soul of the apology. And uh, I'll repeat a couple of the key lines here. One is, uh, Oh, my friend, why do you, who you are a citizen of the great and mighty and why city of Athens cares so much about laying up the greatest amount of money and honor and reputation, and so little about wisdom and truth and the greatest improvement of the soul, which you never regard or heed at all. Seems a lot of people who get into stoicism do it uh, so as to profit, and they'll go so far as to market hype and lie uh, to make a bit of extra money, countering what Socrates is teaching. Are you not ashamed of this, Socrates asked. And if the person with whom I am arguing says, Yes, but I do care, I do not depart or let him go at once. I interrogate and examine and cross-examine him. And if I think he has no virtue, but only says that he has, I reproach him with undervaluing the greater and overvaluing the less. And this I should say to everyone whom I meet, young and old, citizen and alien, but especially to the citizens, inasmuch as they are my brethren. For this is the command of God. Again, Socrates references the command of God. A lot of people uh, often say that Socrates and the philosophers of his day and age were did not believe in the gods, but they certainly did. As I would have you know, and I believe that the, to this day no greater good has ever happened in the state than my service to the god. Then Socrates says, For I do nothing but go about persuading you all, old and young alike, not to take thought for your persons and your properties, but firstly and chiefly to care about the greatest improvement of the soul. I tell you that virtue is not given by money, but that from virtue come money and every other good of man, public as well as private. Uh, so often it seems that... Uh, virtue and money and wealth are reversed that uh, people see a lot of money and wealth and think that's a signal of virtue and or they see somebody who isn't quite as rich and they see that as a lack of virtue of course it, it lines up in very different ways but in this whole idea of pursuit of virtue socrates also means the pursuit of excellence becoming really really good at something is where ultimately uh, wealth and money come from. It's not those who set out just pursuing money for money's sake, but rather those who become good at something and become useful to others and are able to perform some type of service or contribute in a way that enriches other people. Steve Jobs stated that he would gladly trade all of his technology to spend an afternoon with Socrates. And when you look at a uh, giant great giant technology companies, at least in their earlier years, they derive their value from creating wealth for other people, uh, useful products. 
and uh, enriching people's lives. So the whole idea of pursuing excellence in uh, product design and uh, that that is the true source of money. Socrates talks about uh, how it is that so, someone will say, and are you not ashamed, Socrates, of a course of life which is likely to bring you to an untimely end? And there he says that there you are mistaken. A man who is good for anything ought not to calculate the chance of living or dying. He ought only to consider whether in doing anything he is doing right or wrong, acting the part of a good man or of a band. bad. And it's interesting that at this point, he references the great Achilles. And uh, as the legend goes, Achilles was told by his mother that if he returned to battle to avenge his friend and slay Hector, who had killed his friend, then Achilles himself would die. But Achilles doesn't hesitate to return to battle, knowing full well that he will die uh, after he has avenged his friend. Uh, he's given the choice to return to battle and die uh, and slay Hector, or he can just go home and live a long and happy life uh, far away. So Socrates turns to the greatest uh, Greek hero of epic mythology and legend, the great Achilles, and he likens himself to the warrior, the greatest warrior, the greatest Greek warrior, and in so doing, he makes philosophy an heroic act. So it's the whole idea that he, he's taking action by speaking the truth and choosing his pursuit of virtue and teaching of virtue. And he concludes that this is my teaching, that again, that, uh, that virtue does not come from money and wealth and privilege, but that all those things derive from the pursuit of virtue. Socrates says, this is my teaching. And if this is the doctrine which corrupts the youth, my influence is ruinous indeed. But if anyone says that this is not my teaching, he is speaking in untruth. Then he says, Wherefore, O men of Athens, I say to you, do as Anita's bids or not as Anita's bids, and either acquit me or not. But whatever you do, know that I shall never alter my ways, not even if I have to die many times. So that's a beautiful passage. And uh, in that heroic act, you can see that kind of transcending Socrates and resounding down throughout all of history. I mean, Socrates is right at the foundations of Western philosophy, which lies at the foundations of Western science. And in science, it has always been the idea of, uh, you know, Bruno being burned at the stake for suggesting the stars are... Uh, distant suns and Galileo uh, going under house arrest for uh, s stating that the earth uh, is not the center of the universe and the earth goes around the sun. And on down throughout all of history, uh, the advancement of science, you could trace it back to Socrates and thus you can trace it back to the honor of Achilles all the way on back there. And now it's interesting that the very first word of Homer's Iliad is rage and it's the rage of Achilles who is upset that his very own commander has taken Achilles prize and to put it briefly basically the commander uh, Agamemnon he wanted to show Achilles who's who so to speak so he's kind of the manager the leader and even though Achilles was the greatest warrior, he says, yeah, you might be the greatest warrior, but I'm still commander here. So I get to take the woman that you love. That is mine. So he takes Braesis, and Achilles quits the Greek army in a fit of rage. So the rage of Achilles on the very first page of the Iliad is against his very own commander. And of course, without Achilles, the Greeks begin to lose. And it says, as the will of Zeus was done. So it's that whole idea that Zeus uh, stands on the side of the honorable poet warrior, the true talent, the higher talent. 
And of course, uh, it's this kind of a managerial lesson that the most important thing to do is to reward the employees who do the best and the most work. So Achilles quits because of honor. He's dishonored in front of everybody because the commander says he's going to take Achilles' prize in front of everybody, kind of to put him in his place. And Achilles sees that, you know, what he earned by his action is his in his in his mind, of course. And I would agree with that. And then uh, later on in the poem, uh, as the Greeks are losing, they beg to have Achilles back. So they send an envoy and they offer him all kinds of rewards, like a whole bunch more land and uh, 10 times the amount of prizes, 100 times the amount of prizes that was taken from him. And then they offer him parades and uh, great honors and medals. And at one point he says, well, that's all fine, but I received my honor from Zeus. And it's a whole idea that he's the greatest warrior and someone giving him a medal can either add to that nor detract from it. And I, I've often seen that, you know, the way that awards go, they often confer more of the award onto the person giving to it. Uh, the person who's giving the award actually receives more of the honor because the person who's receiving it already has it. Uh, so that's kind of what Achilles is pointing out. And he's saying, you know, I really don't need any of that because I received my honor from Zeus. And then, so, you know, he won't go back to fight for, you know, all these countless riches and being made, uh, giving, give, being given land and the daughter of the king, uh, becoming a king in his own right. But for him, he says, no, the guy dishonored me. So, you know, once a man's honor take, is taken, there's no giving it back. There's no amount of wealth. And then he points out that when he's on the battlefield, he's risking his life. So that's why important, that's why honor is so important in such situations. Because, you know, it's the only thing he's getting paid with, while at the same time, he's risking his entire life. And that's why honor is so important. So as the book progresses, of course, uh, we know Achilles does eventually return, as Socrates alluded to. And the reason he does that is because his best friend, Patroclus, borrows Achilles' honor when Achilles isn't fighting and goes into battle. So Hector, the great Trojan of the enemy side, uh, slays Patroclus, thinking it's Achilles. And then Hector claims the armor of Achilles. So when Achilles hears of Patroclus, his good friend's death, he flies into another fit of rage. So remember it began, he began in a fit of rage and he returns uh, all of a sudden to a fit of rage. And there's a whole book, I think it's book 22 or 23 of the Iliad, that all Achilles does is kill everybody in his path. And he's even killing the river, fighting the river. Uh, as it's turning red from all the blood. So uh, in a fit of rage, he returns to battle knowing that he's going to die because that, that's what was prophesied. Uh, I mean, again, he had the choice. He could uh, return on home in peace and live a long, happy life as a king, or he could return to battle to avenge his friend. So what Homer is doing with Achilles is uh, painting a beautiful portrait of a man who both lives and dies for honor. And to me, a lot of people see rage, that Achilles was a man of rage. But what you have to realize is his rage is his honor embodied. It's his honor acted out. And remember uh, how all the Stoics, Epictetus, everybody says, it's not about words, it's about deeds. Acta non verba as the Latin goes. Words, I mean action, not words. Uh, and so basically Achilles is that beautiful portrait of a man who lives and dies for honor. And I think the, the vast power, I'll, I'll have another lecture devoted to uh, Homer's Iliad, and I'll trace all the huge and vast compliments it's gotten from the likes of Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, uh, everybody, uh, Goethe, uh, Voltaire, 
everyone loved uh, the Iliad and Odyssey. I mean, of course, it inspired uh, so many of the other epics, Virgil's Aeneid on down, Dante's Inferno, Paradise Lost. It, it's all in there. Uh, but again, I think that is the beauty. Uh, the very first word of the Iliad is rage, but it's actually the very first word is honor because it's the honor of Achilles that's violated that throws him into the rage. And because he's a man of action, that's what happens when he's dishonored. So, uh, well, that's enough for now. And uh, I will connect with you guys soon. I look forward to doing a longer lecture on Homer's Iliad. <laughs>